All righty. Okay, I think we should start. It's um, 1.04, so that's starting on time, really. And um, I want to introduce our, our third plenary speaker, Brian Dewsbury. Um, and Brian is the Associate Professor of Biology at Florida International University and Associate Director of STEM Transformation Institute. He has a BA from Morehouse College and a master's and PhD from Florida International University. Um, he's the PI of Science Education and Society, SEAS program, where his team conducts research on social context of education. He's a fellow of the John Gardner Institute and the Radically Inclusive Open Science Institute. Um, he conducts faculty development and support for institutions interested in transforming their educational practices pertaining to inclusive environments, and has worked with over 100 institutions in North America, the United Kingdom, and West Africa. He's got a book coming out. Is it out yet, Brian? Norton's Guide not, to Inclusive not, Teaching? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not okay, December. it's coming out. December. We'll announce it when it does. Mm -hmm. Author of when, What Then Shall I Teach? Another upcoming book, which rethinks equity in higher education. He's the founder of the National Science Foundation's funded Deep Teaching Residency, which is a national workshop aimed at supporting faculty and transforming their classroom to incorporate inclusive practices. Um, Brian is from Trinidad and, and Tobago and proudly calls the Twin Islands Republic home. Our first speaker was also from the Caribbean and very, very proud of that fact too. She was amazing. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who'll tell you more about himself. I think the, the trend here is in the future, you need to invite more Caribbean speakers, right? I think we, <laughs> I mean, you're batting about 500 percent. right now. Yeah. Right, I'm just saying, <laughs> get out up to 75, 80. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, well, thanks for showing up everybody. And I'm, I'm glad to glad for us to continue to have this conversation. Um, let, me, let me just begin, let me share my screen first and then we'll begin. The video can just give me a thumbs up that you see my presentation screen. Okay, sweet. <clears throat> um, well, good afternoon again. Uh, it's 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 hot in Miami. It's rainy, but it's good. I'm alive. I have a lot of things to be grateful for, um, including being able to spend the next 45 minutes or so with you. And I say 45 because I I do want to hear a few questions and hear your thoughts on some of these things, and. I do have to confess to you that that when I'm having these conversations, you know, I I have a I have the privilege of of giving a lot of these kinds of speeches, but they're never the same. They're never the same. At least not the way I run it, right? They, they, I'm I'm always in conversation mode, and and conversation mode means that your your thinking is always evolving on issues on which it needs to evolve, and. You know, just yesterday I was meeting with some colleagues and, and we were working on a project and one of the questions of the, the director of the project was, you know, why do you, why do you focus your research career on teaching? And I said, I don't focus my research career on teaching. I focus my research career on questions about social justice and society and governments and political spaces. Teaching just happens to be a thing that's in the midst of that and gives us the opportunity to think about those broader issues in unique ways. Let's not lose focus here. For me, the, 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 the goal, the aim, this game was never just about the classroom. The classroom was a beautiful representation of what we could be. So I've sat through the last decade of, of all of the all of the movements, right? The PBL and TBL and ABL and and active learning, and, and look, I know I sound like I'm hating, I'm not. I do all of that stuff in my class. I enjoy it, it's great, you should try, right? Let's get it out to do it. But I've always felt that the thing that many of those strategies were trying to do didn't get to the real focus of what the class should be. And that's cultivating the humanity of the individuals involved. And that goes beyond a clicker that goes beyond a textbook that goes beyond 
you know, even your even you know the, the, the elements of your curriculum, it it it, it aims it, it positions itself between a greater aim, and I want to try to talk about that greater aim with you today. The question we begin with is, what is the goal of education? I put inclusive in brackets because quite frankly, I really hope that 10, 15 years from now, we're not still talking about inclusive education. Hear me out. I didn't say I didn't want education to be inclusive. I say I didn't want us talking about inclusive education because what we really want, what we should want, is for education to be defined automatically as something that is inclusive. It doesn't need a special label. It doesn't need a textbook to explain to you what inclusion looks like. You come into this profession with an understanding that inclusion is a bedrock upon which the whole education enterprise works. And this isn't new information, right? I, you know, the things I write and talk about, I don't, I don't claim, you know, make any claim to have discovered these things. You know, I'm pulling a quote for you from, from John Dewey back in the 1930s, who, who is talking about a goal of education being this opportunity to share a social experience that allows you to become integrated in a de democratic community. I know these days, some of us, myself included, my question, if it's really a democracy, we'll save that discussion for another time. But what I always loved about John Dewey's writings and Paolo Freire and Miles Horton is that they were looking beyond the classroom. They weren't looking to see who will get an A or B or a C in intro bio. They were playing for the long game, like, when you go forth and become that employed adult, hopefully, or whatever you choose to do, do you have that understanding that to be part of this democ democracy is not a passive thing, it is a participatory thing? And so therefore, what does it mean to participate? What does it mean to live in a society, in a country, in a political system, where it's expected that everybody who is within that society is taking part in the decision-making process. We, we take these things for granted, right? Because we can vote. We can, you know, write up ads. We can, you know, have decisions. We are supposed to be contributing to these things. We make choices with our legs to the voting booth. This is participation and it actually has a meaning. And we take for granted and maybe rightly so, I don't know if it's rightly so or wrongly so, but there's a history to this. Stay with me here. In the 18th century, I believe it's the 1700s, somebody can fact check that if they would like. After they beheaded two of the English monarchs, and John Locke writes, oh, wait a second, <laughs> all of a sudden, we don't get up every day and be told when to plant our wheat and when to go to war and who to marry and what God to serve. And, and so suddenly you have to figure out what it means as a country. So this is, this is something 18th century England I'm talking about. You have to figure as a country what it means to have a political system where everybody participates. And I bring up John Locke because when the Declaration of Independence was written mostly by Thomas Jefferson, it is on these enlightenment principles that he drew much of his language. The line that says we submit these truths, it is actually a, a scientific method type scenario where we understand there is some evolution of these ideas that are going to take place. Now, I understand that Jefferson is problematic. I understand that what he considered participation, there's some clear holes in that argument. But the notion that as we go through the decades and the centuries to now, thankfully, we've recognized the humanity in enough people that in 2022, we hopefully assume that 
anybody classified as a human being and is part of this society should be naturally and automatically included as a participant. So I, I'll give you all of that preamble to say equity mindedness means that how you identify as a student, your immigration status, the neighborhood you came from, your sexual orientation, your gender identity, none of that should predict how successful you are in a classroom. If when you look at your data at the end of the semester and you are able to say this particular group of people identified in this way, all ended up with Ds or Fs, your mind automatically has to go to this notion that you did not allow everybody to participate. And it wasn't necessarily, in fact, it wasn't because of ability. There was some contingent factor within that experience that disproportionately targeted that group. You may not even be aware of it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's the point we have to start from. Diane Ravitch writes in her book, Reign of Error, talking about K-12 education. This is the, the open line. What we all want is for that child to walk into that classroom and to be well-fed, to be fully confident, to, have, to, to, to believe in themselves, to come from a stable home, to have no scarcity and be fully ready, be fully cognitively present to engage in the beauty of what academic work can be. You only need to think on that for about five minutes, my friends, to know for how many people that is not true for. So once you start going on the list of realizing, but wait a second, there's all these things that by the time they get to your classroom, it means that they can't give up their whole selves then the questions about inclusion is not about, you know, can I put them in groups? Can I do this? Yeah, yeah, do all of that. It's all the social stuff that happens before that we have to be paying, first be knowledgeable of, pay attention to, and perhaps in other aspects of our lives, devote our time and energy to stop. Secondly, participation means a commitment to inquiry. I am not, that does not mean that everybody is going to be set up to be a scientist. It does, however, mean that everybody can be set up to be inquiry minded. Let me explain that a little bit. There is a, we are still in the heyday of a post World War II version of higher education where U.S. higher education becomes, became a knowledge generation machine. And that became the primary function of what it, how you defined yourself as a professor, right? You spend six years in grad school studying this really, really tiny thing and become the world's expert. And you, you go to Chicago in the Hyatt and you present to your 200 friends and they pat you on the back and you get tenure. Professors became rock stars. And I am a big fan of it at least from the standpoint of that technical expertise got us some really good stuff, right? We got a vaccine in like two hours, please. <laughs> we, we need to celebrate the progress where it happens. So, so developing technical experts is one version of participation. But developing, de developing people who understand civic engagement, one of the beautiful things about places like Sensor is our mission here is to re-centralize the value of that second path of participation. So yes, you can be in my science class, you can be in my literature class, and we learn about Faulkner, we learn about DNA, we learn about these things. But the ways in which we organize our behavior in the pursuit of that learning, they are traits, <laughs> they are attitudes, they are ways of being, they are ways of respecting and listening that is preparing you to do the same when you become a voting citizen. So that when you see commercials come on your TV, two or three doctors recommend this. 
I will sell everything in this neighborhood. Vote for me. That, that critical mind is different. So like Malcolm X said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So our, our goal now in this moment is to teach you not to be a conspiracy theorist, but to not have somebody else, somebody else define your reality for you. That's what the inquiry minded does. Last but not least, Participation means understanding that like it or not, we are part of a social contract. It's, it's, like, it's like sacrilege to see this sometimes because people's minds get triggered in all sorts of, you know, are you saying, Brian, we need to be like this country and that country? Look, man, I'm just trying to say the decisions you make can affect me too. The decisions I make affect my family. The way I vote doesn't just impact my household. It impacts my neighborhood, my, my city, my state. So you can feel how you want about, about climate change. They're not waiting for us to, <laughs> climate change is not waiting for us to vote. <laughs> it's gonna happen regardless. So this, to put a check on the rugged individualism, and it's not to say you can't rise up and pull, it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I, I get it. We could do all of that. I don't want to be dismissive of it. But there is a place for both. <laughs> there is a place for your effort and your resiliency and a place for you to recognize that, you know, when I make this decision, there are a lot of people who are affected by it. When I ask scientific questions in this way, there are a lot of people who are affected by it. Who I bring to the table to ask those questions impacts the interpretation of the outcomes. So what I'm going to do next 20 minutes or so is talk a little bit about how this looks in, in my favorite class, Intro Bio. And, and I'll show you the model that generated this. You know, I published this, oh, I thought I'd put the citation, uh, 2019 in Cultural Studies of Science Education. And... And I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> a secret to 27 people. <laughs> it's funny. Um, when, when I first wrote this, I sent this to a journal in my field, um, which obviously I won't name. And the editor replies to me and says, you know, Brian, this is really good. You know, we need more writings about diversity in this field, but, but could, you, could you just make this into like, a list of 10 things that faculty can do for Monday, okay. then this is the journal I'm gonna write for. See, here's the thing. I understand that faculty are busy. I understand that what, 55, 60% of professors are contingent on non-tenured faculty. I understand that we are all asked to teach way more than there's time to do it. We, we're doing too much. This is a DTM culture, doing too much all the time. And the problem I have with writing things that accede to that culture is that you normalize this notion of to do work and to do equity work well is to do it until you're bone tired. If you were in a village and you, there was a bridge going into the city and the bridge fell apart. You won't solve the problem by teaching everybody in the village to swim across the river. You'll fix the bridge. So if the kind of work needed to better understand the equity solutions that we need to go forward requires long, deep work with a lot of time and more bandwidth, that is, it. that is what we need to create and not try to create things to fit the limited time that we have right now. I didn't write anything particularly new in this paper. I, I'm here to tell you. Like I'm citing people from the 1950s and 1960s. This, you know, K-12 educators knows, know this stuff, you know, from the first day they take an education class in grad school. My goal here was just to re-centralize this conversation in higher ed STEM because we had got ourselves caught in a how-to, 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 how-to. 
And I'm asking you to stop and think. We have a moment here where you can stop and think and reorient what we're doing to something more glorious, something more purposeful, something more widely connected to society. I'm biased because I teach intro bio and others teach intro something and maybe teach other classes as well. But I do earnestly feel that intro bio is a privilege to teach. I'm welcoming students with open arms into a beautiful discipline. They would have already taken some science, but, but I, I stand that what I'm going to bring you into is at a different level. And so there's a relentless welcome as Peter Felton says that, that occurs in that moment. There's a transition because I teach um, traditionally age students. There's a transition process that happens when you're going from, from high school to a college classroom and there are things that you're figuring out. There are psychologies that you're trying to navigate. You're trying to explore yourself as an emerging adult. And I've only, teach, I've only taught at, at, at research campuses. So, so intro bio is the class that most research faculty run away from, sometimes literally. <laughs> I'll not attend that faculty meeting because that's when we, it, it's actually kind of funny to me, but I, sad, but funny. Um, but intro is more intro than bio. Once we figure out the psychological things, the bio part is actually not that hard. <laughs> and one of the most beautiful things about being a professor in that class is that moment where they just get it. Wait, they, they, wait, wait a second, this is all I was fussing over. And maybe it's too late in the semester to get an A or whatever, but that next semester they took the lessons that they learned and they, they were a different student from that moment on. So we're looking for that transformational change and we're not trying to measure that change by end of semester grade. We're not saying you're a C and so therefore you're a C student, this is a C experience. I've seen more growth and some of my C students and my A students, no disrespect to them. But this course is about something more than that. So I wanna go through these same participation principles and, and, and connect a little bit for you what this looks like in, in an intro bio class. And, and this is a class that a lot of moving parts. If I had to talk about it, we'd be here all day. Um, and my sons are like right outside the door, so I can't be here. <laughs> um, Identity should not predict success. I understand this from a personal perspective. <clears throat> I understand this as a professor. I understand this as a research faculty who studies equity in science education. Dr. Pat Marstella, who's on this call, might recognize this picture. This is a central spot on the campus of Morehouse College, where I did my undergraduate biology degree from 1999 to 2003. And that bench is still there because I was there last, just a couple of years ago. So I know it's still there. And at the end of orientation week, my parents sat me down on that bench and they said, Brian, we've taken you as far as we can, as we can take you. Good luck. And I didn't understand what that meant. I was 19. I was excited to come and leave the Caribbean and come and live in the US and pursue college here. And I was going after environmental conservation stuff, which is how I met Pat. She ran a summer program. But I was a first generation college student. And I could tell you that now, but at 19, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> I didn't know that was a term, right? And you just, just know that your students are never gonna walk up to you and say, professor, I feel low social belonging. I feel a dose of stereotype threat coming down. Can we talk, that, this is, these are words we use to talk to each other and it sounds fancy and nice, but how an 18 year old brain articulates is a little different, right? You see the, I was seeing the, 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 the chem grades dropping. I was seeing cell bio coming around the corner. 
and the first two C's in the exam and, and thinking, if I go and talk to Dr. Haynes, he'll, he'll see that I'm an imposter. I'm not really as good as all these other pre-med students and all these, you know, because I wanted to go to grad school for environmental stuff, I wasn't as rigorous as everybody else. Nobody was saying that. This was all in my head. And it took the moment until I was within 0 0.02 points of losing my scholarship for a professor by the name of Dr. Larry Bloomer to say, hey, Brian, we had a talk, man. And the difference in the conversation he had with me than any other conversation I had before that point was he asked me what my why was. Why, why environmental cons cons conservation? How are you going to impact the world in a good way in 10, 12 years? What is the thing that is making the work you do now meaningful? And so once the question was about your why, the outcomes were different. Now you realize, well, it's not just about taking classes. I could join his lab. We can start an environmental club together. <laughs> We designed an a, a environmental studies minor. And it just made the last two years of undergrad so much more meaningful. And I take that lesson to my current practice where I take as a given that all of the students in front of me can do the work. I'm, I'm not questioning that at any point. A big part of my job with the intro being more important than the bio is to figure out how to help them navigate or eliminate the psychological barriers that prevent them from seeing their own excellence. And some of them are major big things, but some of them are simple changes, such as the renaming of office hours to student hours. You know, I go from campus to campus and, and one of the funny things I always hear all the time is, you know, yeah, I have office hours, you know, students, they don't come. I was like, all right, how big is your office, right? Typically, unless you're Joe Biden, you probably have an office with two chairs plus your chair. So if they all came, where would they sit? Like, what would actually happen <laughs> if, if that two hours that was on your syllabus led to people coming to your office in droves. So you see is yet another example of the system has actually set this whole thing up where it actually had no chance of working, but it could make us feel comfortable to complain that it's not. And for some students, Brian Dewsbury at 19 included, this notion of going to the professor, PhD person, to say, I didn't understand anything you explained today about glycolysis. Felt like walking a green mile. <laughs> and so simply changing that name to student hours, we moved it to the dorm, the basement of the dorm where the students slept, not in the room, obviously. In the basement, there's a room with like 50 chairs, three whiteboards in it at URI where I was. We average 35 to 40 students every week. And the students who are flying, they come too. And they, the ones who, 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 like, who really get it, you know, you say, all right, Eliza, I want you to explain it to this group and make sure they know it as well as you do. And they go, they, they go on to become learning assistants. And we, the class slogan, is you do not know something until you can explain it to your roommate. I want you to realize that all these things aren't gimmicky. These aren't, these aren't I just pull from a list of things to do. These are things that come from this notion of trying to teach what it means to have agency. You can A, B, C, D your way to the final and even get a good grade and still not feel you have control of that knowledge. It's different when you have to sit and actually explain to somebody who never heard of this, who will have questions for you that you have to answer. That's when you start to A, remember things for real, and B, take 
ownership of it. Because the formative practice you're being given here is that as you go through life, there are going to be a lot of people who will come at you and the way they dress, their charisma, the TV channel they're on, the publication they're writing for, they'll sound very convincing. And you have to be in that mindset of, I enjoy you, but I have questions. I'm going to pay attention to detail. Second, commitment to inquiry. Most classrooms call this group work. We actually call it an opportunity for dialogue. Because again, stemming from this notion that for a society to be functional, there needs to be some skills around how we make decisions on everything from where to build a road to how much taxes should be paid to how the money collected with taxes should be spent. And if we aren't going to go to war with each other every weekend, then there has to be a process by which those differences can be, can be discussed, can be compromised on, can be reasonable. So when I, when I organize groups, I socially engineer them, meaning that they are diverse ethnically, they are diverse by gender identity, they are diverse based on geography. And we spend two whole days in the beginning of class talking about what it means to discuss difficult topics in groups. We go through a process called guideposting where we talk about things like active listening. When things get difficult, turn to wonder. Everybody has a right to speak their truth. This is central bio. Because when they get in groups, yes, they do some things like, you know, punnett squares and, and, and stoichiometry and things like that. But they also take on difficult case studies like Rosalind Franklin, like Tuskegee, like Henrietta Lacks, like COVID. And people are going to have strong opinions. People are going to People are going to hear things or hear a point of view that they may be diametrically opposed to. So it behooves me to give them the skills to prepare them for that conversation. Lastly, we talk about the connection to the social contract. And I wanna be very careful here because I always worry a little bit that people, people will walk away thinking that, oh, what Brian does in intro bio is talk about how bad people were in science and all the bad stuff we did. That, that's, not, that's not the case. I mean, I was born and raised in science. I, I, I believe in it, I enjoy it, I do it. Um, or did it, I should, well, did it in terms of like uh, marine stuff. But I also understand that science is done by people. And there are people who ask the questions that need to be asked or they think need to be asked. There are people who go and collect the data. There are people who interpret the data. There are people who sit somewhere in the offices reviewing papers and deciding what should go out and what shouldn't go out. And I'm not here to say who's bad and who's good and who's in between, but I know that people have biases. I know that people, even groups of very intelligent people can adjacent themselves to the cultural norms of the day. So when you look at some of the things that have happened in history that were blessed by science, we could sit here and, you know, in 2022 and undergo presentism, right? And judge away. <laughs> Right, all the people around Henrietta Lacks and all the people around the American Buddhist Association. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to point out that people's biases are real and those biases have consequences. In less egregious cases, for example, I mean, what it took like 12 years to ask what female chimps do. Why? Because only men were studying. <laughs> They're not critical. So part of discussing the social contract is really being explicit about 
who gets invited to the table to have the conversations? When the data gets looked at, what is it representative of? And is that really telling the full human story? And so my goal is when you pass through that experience, when you go on to be your own scientist or when you go on to be your own lawyer or whatever you choose to be, you have that comprehensive, diverse mindset. You, you go into your meetings or you go into your decision-making processes and then you ask, what's missing? Who's, what voice is not being heard in this process? And if I have to cut some of the content of the bio class, my friends, I will in the name of this, and I have. And we took intro bio where it was cover, 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 you know, get to 40 chapters, which nobody did, which is why I don't know why they kept trying, but we went through a process which was easier than most people think. And we, we said, no, if, if we are going to teach students and not subjects, then we have to make time for some of this deliberative democracy. We have to make time for, for groups to learn how to write, for students to know how to, to communicate with each other and with me. And we have to trust that if we cultivate self-regulated learners, much of this even technical material, they can learn on their own. And, you know, I, I you know, typically in these type of talks, you know, the next slide is, um, you know, did you close the achievement gap or the outcomes gap? Or, we did, we did, you know, I mean, that was never the goal for me. I mean, it, it was gonna happen, I believe, I fully believe that, but that wasn't the end point for me, right? Uh, but I know that we're gonna get pushback, which was, well, if you cut all the content, Brian, how will they possibly know that, you know, there's mitochondria unless you tell them, like you must tell them, otherwise there's no way of them knowing. And so we tracked, the students from my section, which was section four, into their second semester of intro bio. See, what you need to know from what you're looking at right now is that section four had 40% less content, content than the three sections next to it. The vertical axis is their grade in principles of bio two. Even if these lines were at the same height, I could tell you, look, I cut all the content and they're still doing just as well. Like what exactly, what exactly is the reasoning here? If you get time to read this paper, you will see that we actually track them into their sophomore level class. And the gap actually widened. And these are students, this is a class that historically had an assumed failure rate of 30 to 35%. So I'm not going into this situation saying, how do I close the outcome gap? I'm going into the situation asking, how do I get more people to become participants in society? Because if you're getting flunked out of college, if you're getting flunked out of science, then you can't, you can't participate, in, at least not in that way. And so in order to make sure that more of us, more students can remain in that process and remain participants, we have to be teaching to humanity and not just to this stuff. So I'll leave you with just three points on this, three takeaways, I suppose. One is to know who's in front of you, not, not just you have a roster and you might know their names. It's, Know where they come from, know where, know the schools they're matriculating from, what part of the country they're from. Understand if, if you're in a situation where there are feeders, like know the communities and the high schools. Like understand that they're not gonna walk in on blank slates and do things to start building relationships, which I've talked about in other talks about writing reflective essays, doing mini surveys to get to know who they are. Don't just design to make them good biologists. Design for things that promote growth mindset, self-efficacy, self-reliance, agency, participation, critical consciousness. Like meaningfully bring these things in and make them just as important as replicating DNA. And last but not least, 
don't make the end of the semester grade sheet the all the be all and end all of anything valuable in the class. So many papers, including the one I just showed you, and I, I outed myself in the conclusion, you know, this notion that, yeah, we care about belonging and, and community, et cetera, et cetera, but we're just going to measure grades as the thing that, that indicates if belonging happens. If, if, if the classroom is a place for intellectual and social growth, measure the social growth as well. Yes, these things can be measured. They are very well validated surveys. They're reflection assignments you can do. They are, uh, you know, if the resources are there, they are external people on your campus who can come and do focus group interviews. We can put our technical brains to work if we're really serious about it, but we have to be serious about it. I was brought into this world, honestly, by accident, right? I was, uh, fairly typical grad student, minding my own business, going about doing marine ecology work. I was told, and I quote, that to be a good grad student, you must avoid teaching as much as you can. And initially I did. I did my master's on a GA ship, classroom free. But of course, at the PhD level, it's very hard to get a GA ship for that length of time. So, and plus, I think it was actually a requirement to teach for at least a year. And I tell you that that semester I was in that class, I was so awful <laughs> because the training was don't sleep with students, don't spill the chemicals, you'll be fine. But I had an experience talking to them, talking to this. This is the first group of, this is the first class I ever taught. And most of them were first generation college students. A good chunk of them were first generation Americans. And when they talk to you about why they're pre-med and why they're so laser focused on being a doctor and they talk about, you know, all this pressure they get from parents and aunts and, and grandparents about to get to the middle class, you have to go after these certain careers. And you took a step back and you say, well, so then they walk into our class and we just talk at them for 50 minutes a day on cell structure and DNA replication. And then we get mad when they get grade grubby because we have PhDs, right? We love this stuff. Like, why can't you just love the butterflies I study? This is utilitarian. This is a transactional process. There are higher stakes down the road that they're looking at. So every C minus, whether it's a small quiz or a big exam, they're thinking about the 18 people back at home who are saying, no, 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 we need you <laughs> to get to that point. So in conversing with them and getting to understand their humanity is what made me fall in love with what teaching could be. I didn't say what it is. I say what it could be. Every book I've read, every workshop I've gone to, it all, many have been good. But what remains in my heart and soul and drives my practice every day are those 18 year old students, now 29 or whatever, right? But, but who, 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 who looked at me and said, this is what we want out of life and class is just not providing it. I wish we had all day, man. I wish we had like a two-day workshop and we went through all the examples and all the things that we do to reclaim humanity in the classrooms. But I, I do end with a note of hope. I do, I do think that the, the conversations that I'm seeing nationwide are filled with people who are a little bit more wanting of that kind of, of teaching, wanting of that kind of atmosphere. And it's a critical time we're in because one of the things we've been grandfathered into as academics is to, you know, in the subject matter expertise model is you become famous for this thing. Brian writes about this thing. And so you learn to talk to other academics about this thing, even in equity work. So meanwhile, they take the very language we come up with, misdefine it, and weaponize it against our own practice. And what are we? We are flat-footed. 
we have to learn to design our educational systems to be more connected to society. And if we don't, man, we have a lot more trouble coming. Thank you so much. This is how you find me, Twitter, Instagram, email. I'll stop my share screen and I'll take questions if you have them. Thank you, Brian. That was pretty censor, I gotta say. <laughs> C-E-N-S-O-R or S-E-N-C-E-R? Yeah, that's <laughs> hit all the notes and uh, hope there are questions. So are, people can raise their hand in the participants. So. I see. Uh, Rob, Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. I uh, I love your storytelling sort of approach to this. It's coming from your own experiences and 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 uh, conveying the, you know how a person evolves in science and and humanity. Um, I, as an anthropologist, um, run into people um, usually at a, a UH football game at a tailgate party. Um, and they'll say, come up to me and they'll say, Bob, I understand you're an anthropologist. You must believe in multiculturalism. And I say, yeah, it's the only way forward. And that that shuts them up. Um, so I because I, I just don't leave any, there's no doubt about it. It has to be a multicultural. So this speaks to your your social contract piece. I think more and more people are trying to unfortunately envision a white America. It excludes everyone else from the contract. And I, I think being able to come up with succinct ways of telling people that uh, America has to be a multicultural place. So I'd wonder if you could talk about the connection between social contract and multiculturalism. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll take it from this angle, Robert, and thanks for your thoughts. Um, one of the things I, I kind of half mentioned at the end was uh, so many political waters that we're navigating in higher ed in my state. So I'm in Florida, right? So <laughs> insert deep sigh here. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've read the bill many times of, you know, her different interpretations of it. And, you know, the, the crux of it from my lens is this notion that, you know, somebody shouldn't feel bad for who they are, which just as a standalone statement, like, I get it's sort of benign enough that it 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 kind of creates plausible deniability if you if you get my drift. Um, but what what has inspired this whole movement, right, was this notion, you know, begun a couple of years ago during the previous administration, that there is a, a deliberate attempt to make a white America feel bad, right? And, and unless everybody becomes prostrate you know, and, and, you know, cries, begs for forgiveness for their sins, then there is no path forward for that. And, and so to me, it's, it's, it's multiculturalism, yes, but it's, it's even bigger than that. There's this sense, like, what does it mean to live in a multicultural society? Like, what does that mean for, for me, my neighborhood, what does my neighborhood look like? You know, who my children go to school with? Who, who do I run into the grocery? What do I assume when I see somebody, right? There's all these kind of trailing questions from that. From, and I'm sure you know this, Robert, as an anthropologist, right? But all these trailing questions that they go unanswered until they become a problem, right? And so when I when simple things in my life happen, like, you know, I go to the uh, Ecological Society of America conference with a shirt on and two people think I'm part of the coffee staff, right? I'm sure that person didn't mean to be mean, but, but it hasn't fully processed in everybody's mind that yes, you too are an American. Yes, you too belong here. You're not just a guest. You're not just tribal into this particular space and we leave you there. You are as equal as I am. And I think Robert, we have, we have a road to travel on that. We have a long road to travel on that. Um, some things are better, but some things aren't as, as much better. So I hope that gets a little bit of your question. Thanks for asking. We have Charity, um, Charity in the question. Yeah. Charity? Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, always an, an inspiring talk. Um, you mentioned a lot, a, a little bit about the first two days of your class where you mentioned the community building exercises. Um, 
And can you share a little bit about your approach and where you might where where you found some really amazing resources to do that type of work at the beginning? Well, I can tell you, you can find some amazing resources with my email address. <laughs> I can just email you all my documents. That's like one of the things I love about Ed Research. Everything is just so share, share, share. You know, in basic science, they hide their posters in the corner and they come from center. So, uh, all right, the first resource I'll give you is um, something called Guide Posts, which I got from the, the former William Winter Institute in Mississippi. They're now called the Alluvial Collective. And it's a, basically a list of nine statements that is the, the aim of which is to set the cultural norms for how difficult dialogue will take place, right? They use it in, I argue, more extreme circumstances like, you know, what to do with Confederate flag, you know, things like that, right? We use it to, to talk about, you know, things like Henry Lax and, um, um, you know, Tuskegee study and stuff like that, right? Uh, I'm very mindful that I typically teach 18 and 19 year olds and so where they are, I, I need to be very, um, uh, disciplined and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, careful, right? In, in how I'm opening them up to that kind of discussion. The second thing I can share with you comes from the Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning Network, POGL. And they have uh, exercise and economics exercise that, that, that kind of walks you through different roles in a group. I found to be really, really good. Um, and, you know, it's an example exercise. And then we stop and we talk about what worked well, what didn't work well you know, all right, do the rest and, you know, report back on that. There's a couple, <laughs> are you holding off a flyer? <laughs> um, so you might- A you koozie, might have, actually. Oh, for real? <laughs> it's a koozie. So I'm, I'm happy to share those with you directly, um, but those are two of the main things I use. Pat, some of that leads on to Pat's, Pat's comments, but off you go, Pat. So uh, that was a wonderful and inspiring talk, Brian, as, as I always expect from you. But could you, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about how uh, people might <clears throat> approach knowing the students' pathways, their needs, their strengths, et cetera, especially for big classes? Do you yeah. have an exercise that you do or do you, um, or, or does that come out in other ways? Yeah, well, I, I'll suggest two things. Um, one is there's a small survey I send out called the First Day Info Sheets. The reference is Kilpack and Mellon 2020, Jambi. Um, I don't know, it's like 10, maybe 12 questions, but it's, it's light stuff. Like, what are your pronouns? Where are you from? What, are you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, describe one thing your professor does that you like. One, what, describe one thing you hate. Um, describe something you're good at, right? Um, so it's a, it's a really nice way to kind of get to know them because it's in a survey form. It's easy to scan and I don't scan it. I actually read every single one. I mean, my class is 155, so it's big, but it's not like ginormously big. So in a couple hours, I could actually read everyone. The second thing I do, which I, um, I have to say might be my favorite exercise of teaching ever is I have them write, um, a this, I believe essay that I literally copy paste from NPR. Cause damn it, I pay $15 a month to support them. So, so, so I could take my browser and scroll. So and, and so at this, I believe dot org forward slash guidelines that actually takes you directly to the page with the prompt. And it says something along the lines of describe the values that shape your deepest passions. And so I read all those essays and wow, talk about knowing their history on a personal level, that's next level stuff. So I'll stop there because I see some more hands. Bill. Yeah, hi, uh, I teach chemistry and I deal with what I've often referred to as the tyranny of content. Mm -hmm. And you seem to have found a way to break that in the analogous kind of biology course. So can you say a little more about that? It, we always feel everything we have in the yeah. syllabus is so critical, you know? Thank right. you. Good, good question. So we did three things. I think it's three, but I'll, yeah, I'll go through them. Number one, Mike, uh, there were four sections and uh, yeah, there's three things. Every semester people would complain that they couldn't finish. 
So, okay, well, that's easy. <laughs> if you couldn't get to it, then clearly it's too much for the time allotted. All right, so that's kind of, we leave that hanging for now. The second thing, what was happening is a phenomenon we call TYD, teacher dissertation. So even though technically it's supposed to be the same content in all four sections, the guy who got his PhD in developmental biology spent like two weeks on blaster seals and then the guy who goes a herpetologist. You know, so that, that was people's kind of disciplinary bias was causing them to spend more time on things, right? The third, perhaps most critical thing, which I think is what really led to, to a good chunk of stuff going, is we talked to the upper division classes, right? We talked to the cell bio class. We talked to uh, uh, micro. We talked to ecology. And I said, what do you really want them coming in here knowing, right? And so before that, there was all these, you know, asinine things about like trying to go through the all of glycolysis and Krebs cycle and or every all the Q, Q, um, cytochrome Q and electron trans. Like, no, no, not now. <laughs> so, so have turning the class into a little, a lot more of a conceptual focus and having them understand the kind of bigger picture of how energy moves, how it transfers, and oh, by the way, they'll. You know, sometimes students after three weeks come up to me and say, is this a chemistry class? Because, because we, we actually spend a lot of time on, on functional groups and how bonds work. You have to understand these laws first because biology comes way after that, right? So, so it's not changing the class, and I hate to say this out loud, into more of a biophysics, <laughs> a physics chem class for four weeks and then getting into how it applies to bio. Um, it, it made the class make more sense, but we only had the bravery or maybe the license to do that once we talked to the upper division classes. And that, that was the key. So I don't know how it, I don't want to speak for how it works in, in chem. I know with chem, you both have upper division, but you also have service class for a lot of other majors. Um, so that conversation perhaps has to be both longitudinal, but also lateral. Um, but either way, the conversation is what sort of drove it. Oh, thank you. So basically, you did this in a very collaborative way with, with the sections of the course you're, you're teaching and the recipients of your students, which makes great sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it took a few years. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a kumbaya moment from day one, but, but, but it, we got there eventually. Uh, well, and you've also touched on the fact that doing this interdepartmentally would have great value as well, yeah, exactly. because you'd like more Actually, we don't do organic chemistry. Most places don't until the second year. Right. And you could use that already um, for the first biology or early biology courses. Right. Okay, this is Thanks. great. Th Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, and that leads us into to, to Doc, who is also a chemist. So, uh, First of all, to Bill, we do our civic engagement in the lab. So, you know, and the lab was always coupled to what we're talking about in a lecture. And we do this at, for lower division courses and upper division courses. So that's, that's how we get students involved. Great. Uh, right. So, uh, and then for Brian, do you have, I, I, I'm sorry if I miss this, do you have like pre-COVID kids versus post-COVID kids versus why we're going through it? I mean, do you have, do you see any, if you do, uh, do you see any differences there about their willingness to get involved? That's a good question. So the, the short answer is I will have my first post-COVID kids this fall because last summer I moved from University of Rhode Island to FIU. Um, so for this first year I've been back at FIU, um, I wasn't in the classroom setting up my lab, et cetera. Um, I did teach during COVID for at least part of it, at least one semester. I mean, that was its own experience. Um, I was part of the pivot and then the fall right after was his own experience, you know, no vaccines yet and all of that stuff. Um, but what I would say is I, I've remained connected to my, a lot of my wonderful colleagues who do teach and I've taught throughout and I'm teaching now and, and my wife is a first grade teacher um, and I have a lot of projects with high school teachers. So I'm, I'm very plugged into what is happening student-wise post-COVID and my sense, not a scientific measurement, my sense is it hasn't been good. Um, the learning loss has been pretty severe and not just the learning loss, but also the, the inability to socialize and all those things that are kind of critical, especially at the high school level. And so my friends teaching, especially at the intro level, 
told me like students coming in and like, what is happening right now? Because they normally would see a lot more maturity, a lot more, a lot of things that they got used to are different because it essentially almost was like a two year gap. And I feel like this needs to be said, I don't know if this was your experience doc, but I feel like this needs to be said relatively bluntly because there's a little bit of a collective denial happening um, going on as far as the, um, of how we've been affected and perhaps still are being affected by pandemic related things. And I think beginning to be a little bit honest about that starts to lead us towards thinking like, look, man, this isn't the same as it was in you know, 2018, 2019. Um, so I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to be back in a class in about three weeks. So we'll see what this intro bio is going to you know, uh, bring. Um, but my friends say they definitely have seen a lot of uh, post-COVID effects. Hi, Andrea. Thank you. So, so Jessica had a question a long time ago back in the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, did somebody Hi. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the STEM identity development work that you do with your students. I work with K-12 STEM teachers. So a lot mm -hmm. of parallels with our um, student teachers working with their students as well. Yeah, um, I, I'll give you a couple of things. Um, and one of it is, is the framing, right? The kind of framing I take towards STEM identity. What I don't like to do, or what I don't do, I should say, and I've seen other people do it, is I, I don't get into labeling, I don't say it's like there's a black scientist, there's a Hispanic scientist, right? They're just a scientist. <laughs> it's a scientist. That's it. All right. So when I when I have diverse examples, you know, when I have a whole unit on George Washington Carver and you know, um, uh, you know, Tyrone Hayes and things like that, like, like I'm not I'm not saying, oh, today we're going to do a black scientist. Let's talk about it. Um, the assignment is just for them to look up this individual and look up their work. And, and so the, the goal behind that, Jessica, is to sort of normalize this notion is that to be a scientist is to be a scientist and the, how you identify should play no role in that reality, right? That's, that's part of it. That's kind of more the personal level. The second thing um, we do, the last week of class is called Career Week. And uh, we do a number of things, you know, we talk about what different scientists do, you know, I have a, a, a video blog that I started when I was in grad school, we had invited diverse scientists from around the country to talk about their life and career, it's called Confluence, so if you Google Confluence, Q-B-I-C, separate word, F-I-U, it should come up, and so they watch that, we talk about that, and then their assignment is to apply for, for a summer research internship, and the by that time, so this is like mid-November, mid to late November, the NSF usually has all of their funded REUs organized by discipline and geography. So they go to their website and they have to pick one and they have to put together a packet. They have to write their own letter recommendation. They have to download a CV. They, well, not download a CV, like, you know, update the resume and download a transcript. And, you know, they put together a packet, right? And so part of it is... You don't have to work in Home Depot next summer. <laughs> you get paid $6,000 and they fly you there and feed you. You actually make more and you get the experience, right? You are amazed how many first-generation students had no idea that was a thing, like no idea, right? It blows my mind every year. Um, and secondly, obviously, selfishly, I'm trying to get them to actually follow through with the application. So every year, just more and more, like people actually just, oh, you could do this. I could go to Chicago for a summer. Really? You? Yeah. And so that's part of it. I'll say a quick third thing, Jessica. Um, one of the things I like about cures and, and um, you know, even what, what Doc said about civic engagement in the lab is we, we need to move science towards, uh, science instruction towards doing science and not talking about science. Right, like we come with all these fancy words in, in, in STEM about flip class and all this stuff. And it's like, well, this is what they do in English all the time. Like nobody, there's no professor standing in front of the class reading sound and fury word for word, <laughs> right? The class only made sense if you read, read the book at home and you talked about the themes, right? But, but somehow in STEM, like unless you say it, it does, it apparently is not good information. So really trying to think about what scientists do on an everyday basis and doing those things in a classroom that's what we do more of, Jessica. So 
we do a lot more data analysis. Every week begins with a beautiful question and we spend the entire week answering the question. Why does the flounder not freeze in New England winters? Because they have a really nice protein in their blood that prevents them, you know, but, but, we, but in answering the question, we go through protein folding, we go through physiology of fish. It, so the, the, the art of answering the question is what we do as scientists. And that, those three things kind of coupled together is how we try to sort of build identity in science. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Any, anybody that would Yeah, there's a lot of questions. We are running a little bit behind, but get your questions in and... I, I um yeah, I can't follow the chat. So if you, oh, if don't a worry. question pops and you want to tell me, feel free to, sorry. I don't know if we missed very many in the chat. So if you did, please, please feel free to ask. And feel free to email me if you, you know, if you don't talk now, um, I am pretty responsive. I think those three, those three last statements on your slide was kind of the epitome of what we're trying to do with sensors. So I mm -hmm. think that was like a call to action for us. And I actually also thought about, you know, folks in our ideals, we say about having the students take responsibility for their learning. We could consider altering that to say students should take agency mm -hmm. <laughs> for their learning. That might be a bad idea, you know. I've always felt bad about res putting responsibility on them in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. Agency might sound better. Right. That's a good framing. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any questions, I really appreciate your attention. This was fun. Um, Sense is a great community, but I think you know that. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, but if you want to chat more, you know where to find me. Eliza? Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, as usual, and I also should note that Brian and Sarah, um, who's Tolbert, who's going to speak tomorrow, helped frame the the topic, the, the title, and and the theme for this conference. And I think it's really, you know, that's why everything's going together so well, and it's all mm -hmm. sort of reflecting each other. So this is fabulous. Thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate it. And I hope we'll have many more opportunities to work with mm -hmm. you, you know, over the years as we, since you are, set, you, you're doing sensor, boy, you're really doing sensor. So. Um, can, Monica, would you mind reaching out to me about your request? Okay. Because I think I would love to do it. All right, take care.